Like to start off our portion of the show By giving a taste of a little something we call Rock and roll Rock and roll Rock and roll Rock and roll to me. You're listening to the It's Only Rock and Roll Podcast with your host, Don DiMuccio. All right. Welcome to the It's Only Rock and Roll Podcast, our first show of 2021. Happy New Year. I hope everybody has a much healthier, wealthier, and wiser year than we did over the past 52 weeks or so. That shouldn't be too hard to accomplish. And we're going to keep on doing our little part to bring you some of the best content relating to all things rock. And remember, if you have any suggestions for show ideas, guests you'd like us to get, anything, just drop an email at it's only rock and roll podcast at gmail.com or facebook.com slash it's only rock and roll podcast and at Instagram at it's only rock and roll podcast. And remember, that's all one word. Now we're going to get right into the show today because we have one of rock's greatest drummers of all time, along with singer Paul Rogers. This man hit pay dirt twice, co-founding two of the most celebrated bands of the rock era, starting in 1968 with Free and later in the mid-70s, Bad Company. Of course, I'm talking about the legendary Simon Kirk, who, when he's not out on tour with Ringo's All-Star Band or with Bad Company, was kind enough to sit down with me to talk about his days with both bands. And as it turned out, we had so much fun, we both concluded that there was enough material to talk about to fit into two episodes. So today, Simon Kirk talks about Free, from their meteoric rise with classic hits like All Right Now, to struggles with addiction, which cost them a dear friend and bandmate guitarist Paul Kossoff, and how it all inevitably led to the formation of Bad Company, which will be the focus of next week's show. So sit back and enjoy part one with Simon Kirk. Today, I'm in the presence of true rock royalty. Now, that might sound over the top. But not when talking about this legendary drummer of not one, but two infamous heavy blues rock outfits. First as a member of Free, demonstrating his unique and always rock solid approach on songs like All Right Now. And later as a founding member of supergroup Bad Company, with classic tracks like Can't Get Enough, Good Love and Gone Bad, and Shootin' Star. Like John Bonham, Ringo Starr, and Keith Moon, he's one of the few rock drummers who's synonymous with this instantly recognizable tone and style. Please welcome to the It's Only Rock and Roll podcast, Simon Kirk. Hey, Don. Nice yep. to be here. Thank hey. you for having me. Good afternoon, sir. How you doing? I'm good. Everything's good. You know, I've been asking everybody who's been on the show how you've been faring through this pandemic uh, mm-hmm. shutdown. Were you forced to reschedule or even cancel a lot of work? Oh, yeah. We had a whole summer tour, but Bad Company and Rod Stewart, we were going to go out together. I read um, about that. That would have been a, a great double bill. You know, we haven't worked at all the whole of 2020 and... We're trying to look uh, for late summer, early fall for this year. And yep. Now the vaccine has come along. Um, that might speed things up a little bit. But it's been a very barren, a very tough year. I've been hunkered down here in, in uh, Montauk. I live in Montauk at the end of Long Island. Luckily, this summer house, which is quite small, it's quite modest, but it's, it's turned out to be literally a lifesaver because it's pretty isolated. But actually, you know what, Don, I've been... I've never been more busy doing nothing. <laughs> uh, it's funny. I did an album with a friend of mine uh, who lives in England, a singer-songwriter, great singer, and his guitar player, uh, Steve Overland and Steve Morris. Mm-hmm. And they have a band called Lone Rider. And I did an album with them a couple of years ago. Really very, very good. So, uh, And I've been working with, with other solo artists just being able to play music. Uh, luckily, I have a little studio here. That's great. So, yeah. Well, one of the things I've been seeing, and I was going to ask you about this because I'm not familiar, but it sounds very interesting. What is road recovery? Oh, well, road recovery, uh, I mean, most people not know my history that I had a, I've been having an ongoing battle with drink and drugs for many years. And uh, How unique. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. A rock and roller who has a substance abuse problem. Um, and when I came out of uh, one of my several rehabs uh, about 12, maybe 13 years ago, um, the guy, my doctor, my counselor recommended, his name was Scott Biedenfeld, Dr. Scott Biedenfeld. And he said, listen, you've got to keep busy mm-hmm. because, you know, idle hands and all that, you know, sure. the devils, you know, whatever it is. Yeah. So I'm going to put you in touch with a friend of mine who's in recovery and he used to road manage Jeff Buckley. 
And, and that got my attention because I, I love Jeff Buckley. Sure. And, um, he put me in touch with Gene Bowen, who ran this organization called Road Recovery, uh, based in New York City. And Road Recovery uh, helps primarily teenagers and uh, people in their early 20s. Although there's no age limit, but the core popula- population, uh, we help kids with substance abuse, uh, all forms of psychological sexual abuse. You know, kids, they're like porcupines. They have hundreds of these things jabbing at them sure. as they grow up. Yeah. And and uh, the first meeting I attended as, a, uh, as an observer, eventually I became a counsellor, I was absolutely blown away with the fact that there were several kids in their mid-teens getting sober. Wow. And, and we used music. A lot of them played an instrument. Yeah. So we'd have a 60-minute, 12-step meeting. And then after that, we'd have a jam. And me being a drummer and guitarist, uh, obviously, you know, they got me to, to play drums and help kids play drums and guitar. Mm. And it was amazing, Don, to see these kids blossom knowing, number one, that they weren't alone, which is one of the great things about 12-step meetings. You're not alone. Right. And two, to be able to, to play music and create with, with other like-minded people, boys and girls. Can you imagine if you had something like that as a kid? Oh, It might have made all the difference well, that you I wouldn't have had that, to go uh, through, you know? I think it would have made a, a lot of difference, you know, uh, because being in recovery nowadays, it's not a big deal. Right. It's not to say that I'm, you know, I'm an addict slash alcoholic. You know, 40, 50 years ago, you just, you wouldn't, you would never own up. And now it's part of your CV, you know, if you're right. applying for a job. Oh, I'm yeah, in recovery, yeah. yeah. Been sober three years, blah, blah, I'm an alcoholic. Boom. You know, it's, it's, like, it's like an extra step up to attaining that position. So, yeah, things have changed an awful lot in, uh, in 30, 40 years. I mean, even with your own fellow bandmate, late Paul Kossoff, yeah. you know, what could you have done back then? There was no infrastructure necessarily um, no. to say, you know, you know, you got a problem, we want to help you. you just- well, it's funny, I, I'm writing a book. I don't know whether I'll release it because it, uh, it seems like every aging rocker now is writing books, but yeah. it's, it's, a, it's a cathartic exercise. Sure. And I wrote extensively, obviously, about Free and about Paul Kossoff. And at the height of his addiction, when he was only 24 or 25, he was consuming so many drugs and he had endangered, uh, obviously, his own life. Uh, He had been the sole reason that Free had to cancel two back-to-back American tours. And our name was Mud. Mm. And, and, and the way that we dealt, or rather the management dealt with Koss's addiction was to, you know, just not even think, not even talk about rehab, right. but to just, you know, say, go home, uh, you know, get yourself together. Uh, and in a few weeks, you know, we'll, we'll, you know, we'll talk again. He never once went to rehab. Whereas nowadays, if he had displayed a fraction of his intake, he would have been whisked off to rehab so that his feet didn't touch the ground. Of course. Uh, That's just the way things are nowadays. Let me take you back. I want to know your earliest memory of hearing rock and roll for the first time. Ooh, wow. Well, that's, that's, that's a very interesting question. Although I was born in London in 49, I was brought up in a very remote part of England on the, the border of Wales. Mm-hmm. It's about 150 miles northwest of, of England. Now, that might not sound like a, a big distance in America, but remember that in England, you're never more than 60 miles from the sea mm. in any part of the country. Right. So 150 miles in England is a long, long way. And I was brought up in this uh, very remote part of uh, Shropshire. That was the county. We we didn't have any uh, electricity or running water. So really? No, no, not for about four years. And then we moved to a little village uh, away from my cottage where we did. We had a, a electricity and running water. And I had acquired a little transistor radio with an earpiece. So I got it in the mail. It was one of the, the most amazing acquisitions I ever made in my life. <laughs> it was getting this $9 <laughs> transistor radio. And on that, I could tune in to a station called Radio Luxembourg. Of course, yeah. Yeah, which was broadcast out of Luxembourg, sandwiched between Belgium and France. And it was a wonderful 
I even remember the frequency, 208. And, and, and a lot of English guys of my age will hold up their hands to the heavens when you mention Radio Luxembourg because it, it broadcast primarily R&B, black music, James Brown, Marvin Gaye, Otis Redding, Ray Charles, as well as, you know, the, the top 40. And I was transfixed. That was really, it wasn't so much rock and roll. That came the next year, 1963, when the Beatles hit uh, in England. Right. And I know they hit in 64 in America. But when She Loves You came out, that was a real eye-opener for me because they started getting interviews and they started talking about Rockabilly, which was the father to rock and roll. And I started listening to Bill Haley. One of the first songs I remember listening to was Bill Haley, Rock Around the Clock. Mm -hmm. And um, Elvis, early Elvis was amazing. Right. Jailhouse Rock. And that first... Da -da, ba -ba, da -da, ba -ba, yeah. da walk through the party in a county jail. And that whole swing thing really got me by the scruff of the neck. And, sure. Uh, I think that was the first eye-opener for me in 63 when I was 14. And then I started listening to more rockabilly, uh, Carl Perkins and um, uh, Gene Vincent and Eddie Cochran. My God, Eddie Cochran was, you know, summertime blues and, and they just opened the, the floodgates for me. That's interesting because I think one of the greatest things the Beatles did, I've said it before, is that they reintroduced America to its own music. Well, that's that's a, a very good point because I remember in the mid sixties, sixty five, sixty six, there was this thing called the blues boom in England, and you get these package tours of BB King, Howling Wolf, John Lee Hooker, uh, Lightning Hopkins, I mean Memphis Slim, mm -hmm. and they would go around Europe and England, and the interviews that these these legendary performers would give would say that we can't get arrested in our own home. You know, people won't come out to see us. So we're getting a second chance in these countries. And they sold out everywhere. I mean, they were, they were like so popular. And in a way, there was this sort of crossover. Uh, how can I put it? All right, Herman's Hermits. Dave Clark Five, Jerry and the Pacemaker. Jerry just I passed know. away a couple of days God ago. Rest his soul. Yeah. yeah, he was great. One of the great guitar players, by the way, but that's another story. The Searchers, they suddenly became ultra big and popular when their popularity had waned uh, a little in, in England. And they went over to the States, especially Herman's Hermits. They became really big. Right. And then... So we got the Blues Boys, you got Herman's Hermits, and I think that's a rather good trade. <laughs> well, why the drums? I mean, what, what inspired you to pick up your first drum kit? I don't know. I mean, I do, and I, I don't really know. I, I like to be all sort of zen and say that drums chose me. But I, I, oh, I, 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 rem I know. I remember, <laughs> <laughs> I do remember the exact moment, and it's, it's a real, a real lightning bolt, uh, and it's a, it, I've told the story many times, but it is absolutely true. We had just gotten our first TV. I was about just mid to late. I was 13, maybe 14. No, 14. And we had a black and white TV. And one of the first programs I saw was a program called All That Jazz. And it featured big band jazz, the, the swing bands. Yeah. And I'll never forget, I was sitting in my living room on the sofa and suddenly on, on the screen came this big band. And it was maybe a 20 piece with trombones, trumpets, saxophones, piano, guitar, bass, whatever. But right slap dang in the middle was this drum kit. And the, the way the, the spotlight shone on the cymbals, it was quite a big kit. And the guy did a solo. And I was absolutely mesmerized by what this guy did. And my mum had a pair of knitting needles on the uh, you know on the, <laughs> yeah. the cushion next to me and i picked them up and i started it was that sort of very fast shuffle. shuffle yeah and i tried to keep up with it you know and started dinking around and I, that was it and i never forgot that moment and um i think one of the reasons that i took to bashing things was that you couldn't get guitars and amplifiers in, in this very remote part of England, you know, where I was being brought up. Yeah. Uh, I went out and carved a couple of sticks from a hedge, <laughs> a 
they were only seven inches long. I never knew until I got a pair through the mail how long real sticks are, which right. is 16 inches. Right. And I started, you know, playing on books and little pans and uh, with my earpiece in my transistor radio and just playing along with whatever came on the radio. And and the next big leap for me, and I'll, I'll never forget this guy, our school bus driver, bear with me, <laughs> our school bus driver, I, I had a little band in high school, you know, did school concerts and things. And he dropped me off. I was one of the last kids to be dropped off. And as I was getting off the bus, he said, Simon, I've got a proposition for you. I didn't know what the word meant, <laughs> but I liked him. He was a nice guy. Yeah. He says, I hear you're a good drummer. I said, well, you know, um, I love to play. He said, well, I would like you to come around with me. I have a disco, the forerunner. The word wasn't even in, in existence in those days. He says, I have a turntable and a stack of 45s, and I play songs in the, the local village hops. And I think it would be a great idea if you set your kit up alongside me and played along. I thought, hmm. what? And he came and met my mum and my dad, and they said, well, and I was like, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. But yeah, I was only 14, 15, you yeah, know. And yeah. they said, well, as long as it doesn't interfere with his homework, we'll give it a few months. And, and I... I did it for two years and I played along to many types of music and I, I had to be in time. Otherwise, obviously, it would sound like a train wreck. And that's where I got my pretty good sense of time. Have you gotten a chance over the years to see him and thank him? Oh, for I wish. No. no, he's probably long, long gone. And it was during one of those village hops that a guy approached me and he was quite a bit older than me. I was maybe 15. Yeah. And this guy, Richie Jones... And he said, I've got a band called The Maniacs. I loved it straight away. Yeah. I love the name. And sure. uh, would you come and play drums for us? So suddenly they want me to join this bunch of country bumpkins. I mean, they really were farmers lads. And and I was in The Maniacs for uh, a couple of years and, uh, you know, went from there. I got to ask you real quick. What was the first proper drum kit that uh, you owned? Gigster. It's called Gigster. G-I-G-S-T-E-R. Okay. It cost 18 pounds and I paid for it myself with money that I earned from mowing lawns. Well, I heard a funny story how you came to join the Black Cat Bones, which would be the band that would inevitably become free. And it reminds me of kind of how Keith Moon joined The Who. I, I don't know about Keith joining the you, you Well, when it. Keith joined The Who, he, he, there were the detours and he'd seen another drum. I think his name was Doug... And he just basically said, I'm better than him. <laughs> and they said, oh, yeah? Well, come on and prove it. And he did. And that was Doug's last night. Oh, wow. <laughs> so you kind of did a similar thing. Well, I was in my little bed sit. It's what we call a you know, one-room flat down in the dumps because my parents had given me two years to try and make something of myself before I went to university. Mm. And I was in the last month of the 24 months. Uh, I've been down in London. I've been doing various menial jobs, you know, washing cars, construction, demolition, la, la, la. Going to auditions, nothing had happened. Mm. And I'd heard about this band called the Black Cat Bones, and I loved the name. I thought it was a great name. But it was a long way across London, you know, a 45-minute subway ride with, with a change and so on. So I tossed a coin, and it's a true story, God's honest truth. Uh, heads I go, tails I stay. And it came down heads, and I thought, all right, fuck it, I'll go. <laughs> and I walked in to this pub, sadly no longer here. It should be enshrined in rock and roll memory, yeah. uh, called The Nag's Head. And um, there was this band playing, and they were pretty good. They had nothing really special, playing at blues standards. But the guitarist really got my attention. He was so good, so passionate, just a really an amazing player. So... They had a break. They all got off the stage and went to their various friends and relatives or whatever. And Paul Kossoff came to the bar and I, you know, sidled up to him and said, man, you really are an amazing player. And he said, oh, <laughs> thank you very much. And I offered to buy him a drink and mm. bought him a drink. I said, but you know what? Your drummer's not very good. And I don't know what maybe said. Well, he wasn't very good. He was dragging. Yeah. And I normally, you know, I sort of keep my opinions to myself, but this was desperation time and I, I, I could see myself up there playing with them. So I said, you know, but your drummer's not very good. I'm a pretty good drummer. He said, well, it's funny you should say that. 
<laughs> because this is his last night and uh, we're having auditions tomorrow. There's another guy coming along. So if you want to come, you're more than welcome. So suddenly, you know, be careful what you wish for, right? Right. Uh, I go home all the way back across London, very excited, didn't sleep well that night, and then came back the next afternoon. Uh, this guy was already playing. Honestly, he wasn't that good. And, and I did. I played a shuffle and a slow blues. I think the shuffle was the thing that got their attention. Anyway, they didn't give me an answer straight away. I had to go back again all the way home. Mm. Uh, and they called me the next day and said, you know, we like you. And, and if you'd like to join, you've got the job. And um, with me and Kos became very good friends. I, I liked him a lot. I was the country bumpkin, really. He was the city boy, you know. Yeah. But we, we formed a bond. About six months later, he said, I've met this great singer and uh, we want to form a band together. And that was the beginning of Free. How long until Andy came, Andy Frazier? Well, Andy came along soon afterwards. We knew this guy, Alexis Corner, uh, who was a, a legendary blues guy. And a lot of people had been through his band. Jack Bruce, Ginger Baker, uh, a, a young singer called Mick Jagger. I've heard of him. Yeah, uh, he, 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 he did pretty well. And Paul Kossoff knew him very well. And I think he put the word out that we were looking for a bass player. Well, first of all, I, I had to pass the audition, if you will, with Paul Rogers. And I only found out about this only a few years ago, that when I went to the house where we were to meet Paul Rogers, I went with Paul Kossoff. We had a little jam uh, without a bass player. We got on very well. But the guy whose house we were having this rehearsal in was going to be the drummer. And I, really? Yeah. Wow. And I had no idea. And when I did my little party piece with the two Pauls, yeah. uh, the guy didn't even come out, you know, and apparently he was a, a little pissed off, you know, I, I, I got the gig. But anyway, that's a, that's a long story short. We found through uh, Alexis Corner, he told Paul Kotov about this young guy, and we're talking young. He was 15. Yeah, very young. Uh, very young. And he'd been just played with John Mayle, John Mayle's Blues Breakers, yeah. who had Peter Green and McTaylor and before that, Eric Clapton. Yep. Uh, so anyone who played with John Mayle was going to be good, but we thought, 15, come on. I mean, I was all of 18. Uh, Koss was 17 and Paul Rogers was six months younger than me. So our average age was, you know, 17. We went along to this club to see Andy Fraser, thinking, ah, 15. And then we saw him come onto the stage. He was a little effeminate, you know, he was very slight. Yeah. He, had, he had this wispy moustache that he'd been trying to grow for three years. I mean, it was, eh. And then he started playing Don and we went, what the? He was absolutely amazing. And I'm not just talking about a kid who can play a bass guitar. His stage presence, his confidence, he was really otherworldly. Well, we looked at each other in the crowd and went, okay, oh, now this guy's amazing. Mm. We went to see him backstage. He knew Alexis, and that was our little intro to him. He said, oh, yeah, no, no Alexis. We said, well, we're having a jam <laughs> In a couple of days at the Nags Head in Battersea, he said, I know it. Do you want to come along? He said, I'll be there. And a couple of days later, we went back to the Nags Head, the famous pub where Free was born. And within two or three songs of us playing together, we knew that we had something pretty special. You mentioned Alexis Corner. Didn't he have something to do with naming the band? Yes, he did. Well, he came along about nine or ten o'clock at night after a gig that he'd done. He came and popped his head in. Because he knew we were playing and, and we saw him and we stopped, you know, we finished the song. We all came down off the little stage, sat around. He said, boys, this sounds so good. This is wonderful. He said, well, what are you going to call yourselves? Duh. <laughs> wow. Um, hadn't thought hadn't, of that one. Had, really, had not thought about it. He said, listen, I was in a band with Jack Bruce and Ginger and it was called Free at Last. Yeah. Didn't really rattle our cage too much. Yeah. But then he said... Well, Free at Last has been done. Why don't you just call yourself Free? Now, we're talking in the days of when bands were called Art, mm -hmm. Clouds, mm -hmm. Spooky Tooth, Fresh Garbage. So Free really kind of stood out. Yeah. And apart from the fact that a lot of promoters didn't like Free because mm -hmm. people were saying, oh, there's no admission to come in. <laughs> <laughs> and a lot of them put the free in front, which drove us mad. I bet. Yeah, we we loved it, and uh, and 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 free it was. 
So now yeah. you got the band together and you go see Chris Blackwell. <laughs> were there other record companies kind of shopping? Or? No, no. We were waiting for the record deal to come in. Right. But uh, no, we, nothing happened. And I believe Muff Winwood, Steve's brother, who worked for Island Records, saw us at uh, the Marquee. Okay. And went back to Chris Blackman and said, you've got to check these guys out because they really are very good indeed. So through the grapevine, we got a message to call Chris Blackwell. And Andy, who was just fast becoming the business manager at the tender age, he was now 16, called Chris. Uh, Chris said to him, I've heard a lot about you guys. I'd like to meet you. Would you come to Island Records? Wow. Now, Island Records were really the shining beacon of record labels at the time because they had Joe Cocker, they had Traffic. King Crimson? King Crimson, they had mm -hmm. Spooky Tooth. They mm -hmm. were really an artist-friendly label. So right. we said, yeah, we'd love to. So we went, <laughs> we went to see Chris Blackwell and a little sidebar. We had to climb the stairs, which passed another office called Rack Management, R-A-K, mm. who was Mickey Most and Peter Grant. We would come back to those people a few yeah. years later. Yeah. Yeah. But anyway, we, we went in, we sat down with Chris and Muff, and uh, they said, Muff says, you're very, very good. We'd like to sign you. Ooh. But we don't like the name. Oh, God. And that really set us back because we loved it. And we were on the threshold of signing with a world-famous record label. And Chris was a great-looking guy, very artist-friendly. Yeah. But he's, he was quite adamant. We think free as a name is too wishy-washy. We like the heavy metal kids. No. <laughs> no. And we said, well, with all due respect, or words to that effect, yeah. no, we, uh, we want to stick with free. And then he said the immortal words. He said, well, I think we have nothing else to talk about then. Which is where you're supposed to say, no, please, please, we'll reconsider. I know. No, well, we, yeah. we were very disappointed. Sure. But we kind of felt that we were in the right because he hadn't come up with another name that we went, wow, hmm, okay. Or at least he, say, go, come back, give me a better name. Uh, yeah. Right. Good. Yeah, Heavy very good. Kids. Very good, Don. Get yeah, out yeah. It was like our way or bye bye. Right. So we got up and said, well, thank you for your time or something like that. And we, we left, uh, left the office. And then Paul Kossoff was like, oh, God, what have we done? I want to go back in. And we had to physically restrain him <laughs> from going back in and saying, look. And we, but we were very disappointed. And we, we all went our separate ways that afternoon. And then later that night, I got a call on my payphone from Andy saying, Chris Blackwell called me. And he said, well, he's going to give a six-month trial and we can stick with the name. We you called the name. their bluff. Yeah, I we love call it. Bluff. Yeah. I love it. Record executives, God bless them, they know how to make money, but they're not artists. It's true. You really shouldn't cross that line. Um, well, I, you know, looking back on it now with, with the benefit of hindsight and wisdom that I've, I've acquired over the 52 years since that day, right. I can see, number one, we were kids. And number two, you know, Muff he told me later that he thought we were absolutely phenomenal. Mm. We were really amazing. And this was before the heavy metal had ever been coined. I mean, right. heavy metal came, I believe, from a... Um, Steppenwolf. Uh, was it Steppenwolf? Yeah. yeah. So it was not a bad name, quite honestly, the heavy metal kids. But it was the way that they presented it to us uh, that got our goats, you know. And, it's a know. bad start to a relationship with ultimatums. Yeah. yeah, it was. So you do the first album, tons of uh, sobs. I always like to hear about little things like, you remember how the engineer mic'd your drums? Were you happy with that? <laughs> I didn't know shit about miking drums, to okay. be honest with you, Don. Okay. I, I just remember we, we basically went in, and at the behest of Guy Stevens, who was the producer, we played our live set, bookended by a song called Over the Green Hills that Paul Rogers had written, which is beautiful, mm. a lovely, lovely song, and a couple of other songs that he'd written, Sweet Tooth and I can't remember, Moonshine, I think. But primarily, we did our live set. And it, I think we did it in two sessions or three sessions, eight-hour sessions. Uh, yeah, and, and it was done very, very quickly for £800. It was Morgan Studios in northwest London. And there was a huge crack in the glass partition that separated the studio from the control room that had been gaffer taped, you know, duct taped over. <laughs> and I said, oh, what happened there? And they said, oh, Ginger Baker threw his snare drum at the engineer. 
Um, wow. And, uh, you know, trying to get, you know, break the glass. He succeeded in cracking it, but, oh, <laughs> God, good old ginger. <laughs> right. Yeah. Fire and Water, that was the one that really featured the, the first smash hit all right now, yeah. obviously being played to this day. And I've heard some estimates where it's been played like three million times or something to that effect. Yeah, I think, uh, yeah, you're right. And none of the other singles that you'd released had charted. Was there any pressure from the record company to have a hit? Not really. Uh, the pressure came after All Right Now. Up until the release of All Right Now, we were building our fan base, if you will. You know, we were constantly touring. And someone sent me an old list of, of shows that we were doing uh, around about that time, early 69. Mm. And we were doing, you know, seven gigs, seven days a week. Yeah. And by the time we got to All Right Now, uh, or Making Fire and Water, we had a really good solid fan base. But I th it's quite a famous story now how All Right Now came about. Uh, it was, we had this sort of loping, mid-tempo, blues rock way of playing. A lot of our songs, frankly, they were quite slow. We were a sort of progressive blues, whatever you want to call it. But we certainly weren't a pop band by any stretch of the imagination, but we came off stage one gig up north. I believe it was Manchester or some place up there. And we had to walk through the crowd to get to the dressing room. And by the time we left the stage, the applause had stopped. And so we had a very long walk through the crowd back to the dressing rooms. And by the time we got into the dressing room, uh, I believe it was Andy or Paul Rogers said, you know what, we need something a bit something that they can dance to, something mm. that's more up-tempo and lively. And it was in that dressing room that All Right Now was born. And I believe it was Andy who started bopping around the dressing room, uh, you know, saying, hey, it's all right now, baby, it's all right now. Words to that effect. I'll, I'll never forget it. I never forgot that moment. And Paul Rogers and Andy Fraser were the principal songwriters. And th at that time, they were kind of joined at the hip. They were so close together. Yeah. And I believe over the next uh, couple of weeks, they fleshed out what became All Right Now. And we would rehearse it at sound checks. And, uh, you know, we did it at shows. And it went down a storm. You know, by the time we got to record it, it became the classic that, it, that you hear today. Well, this is one of those stupid questions, but I got to ask it. Where did you come up with the drum break during the guitar <laughs> solo? I mean, it's so unique. It's so easy. <laughs> well, I remember once when Charlie Watts and Bill Wyman were interviewed and the guy was so full of praise for them and said, Charlie and Bill, you're the one of the probably the greatest rhythm section of all time. A little bit of a stretch, but Charlie's deadpan looked in the, the camera and said, you know, we're just playing the song. That's all we're doing. Right. The thing about that, gabom, gabom, gugum, gum, brat, and then back into the outro, right, the, right. or the final verse, it's a one bar fill. That's all it is, because I'm playing quarter notes on the hi hat. One, two, three. It's one bar fill. And if I did, dum, 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 or it's going to break up that flow. And, and as a drummer to drummer, you'll be interested to know that when I started playing it, I was playing eights on the hi-hat. And after a couple of takes, it just wasn't swinging. And I've done this many times since. I just halved what I was doing on the hi-hat. That is brilliant. Doing started because, doing yeah. quarter notes yeah. and it swung it it, it decompressed uh, the whole and it also allowed me to play uh do more takes right because you know anyway so when i get to that one bar fill all of three seconds i just and it, it just worked and i'm not and, even uh, talking about that so much but during the solo that, you know, ticka, 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 oh the ticka, solo ticka, ticka, oh, the part. running <laughs> the guitar solo yeah oh the guitar solo that's what i mean yeah. well that i thought that we needed a change because we we'd had this loping figure this lovely loping beat for through two verses and a chorus and then Koss came up with this that's when I thought a running snare pattern would would lift it. Right. Because if I had just kept doing the dong, it wouldn't have given Koss the lift that that phrase uh, needed, I felt. So I stuck with this running pattern and the, or the guys in the band said, wow, that's, that's really good. Because then I do a press roll into the, the solo itself. And unfortunately, during the edit that we needed to make this like three minutes. I was yeah, just going to say that. 
Uh, a single we had to version c- cuts it all out. Cuts it all out. We had to do it. When we first played it for Chris Blackwell, the boss of Ireland, he said, it's a hit. I mean, wow. But it's too long. And it was. It was five minutes and 50-odd seconds, nearly six minutes, uh, before Bohemian Rhapsody came and changed everything. Yeah, but not before he drew so th- I'm uh, that's true. You yeah. know what I mean? So that's I'm true. All right, I'll take that. <laughs> but they were the Beatles. You know, right. They could have yeah, released yeah, yeah. Uh, the phone book. Right. Uh, but he said, but what I can do is I have a place where we can edit. Uh, and I'm sorry, Paul, Koss, but, uh, you know, that piece is going to have to go. And Koss was a little upset, but you've got to remember, he played one of the great guitar solos of all time in rock history. Yeah. Um, so he... It was either that or it wouldn't get played on top 40 radio. It wouldn't go on TV. So it was it was an investment, if you will. I actually heard it, the single, and it was so jarring because A, that part's not there, mm. and B, Paul Rogers is double-tracked, oh. which is not on the album. And it was just it just sounded like a totally different song. Well, when I you know did the Ringo tours, uh, All-Star Band, he said, well, are we going to play, you know, the, we're going to play the whole thing. He'd done his homework. I was very impressed. Yeah. And I, I said, no, uh, we're, we're going to keep it three minutes. Because he said one of the great quotes of rock and roll. And they asked Ringo years ago, you know, what do you attribute the Beatles' success to? And he said, well, all our songs are all under three minutes and they're all about love. So <laughs> taking a leaf out of Ringo's book, I said, no, no, we'll, we'll just play the, the, the three, three and a half minute version. And, and it was fine. This interview won't end until February if I go with everything I want to talk about. <laughs> But I do got to bring up that you had a great solo album. Well, I don't know if it's a solo album, but Cost Off Kirk, Tetsu, oh, and Rabbit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you sang on that. Yeah. You know, a singing drummer, that's a rare animal. <laughs> and it's a hard well, thing to do. It's funny you should bring, yeah, thank you for bringing that up. I mean, I've always sung and played drums, even when I was in, not the Maniacs, but I have an, another band called Heat Wave, and I had a mic on a stand through my legs. We didn't have a boom stand, so yeah. I, I always sung. And obviously when Free broke up, uh, me and Koss were kind of left high and dry, and we had Rabbit, who was a really good singer, but... It, you know, we shared vocal duties on, on that album. I would love to go back and re-record it because I'm a much better singer now than I was then. But, uh, you know, there you go. And um, there's a song on there that you wrote called Anna, Anna which was yeah. redone years later with, with Bad Company. some other band that you were in. <laughs> yeah. We talked about it a little bit earlier. Paul Kossoff had slipped into a very serious addiction. How much of that do you think contributed to the breakup of Free? Oof. Well, the the spiral was started when Highway, the follow-up to Fire and Water, and the Steeler, follow-up to All Right Now, died a death. And we were under a lot of pressure to produce another, you know, one-two punch like Fire and Water and All Right Now. We came up with Highway, which I thought was a really good album. A lot of people think it's one of the best albums we we made. Mm. The Steeler was fantastic, but sure. it wasn't a top 40 material. It wasn't a hit. And we we were being worked very, very hard by Island Records. And at some point, Paul Rogers dug in his heels and said, I'm tired of this, you know, I want to do other things. And him and Andy broke it to me and Koss during the the recording of My Brother Jake, uh, which is a cute little single that we put out. Me and Koss were about to go and get a taxi and leave because we'd done our bits, you know. And Paul said, guys, before you go, um, look, something we need to talk about. And I'll never forget it, you know. He said, after the Australia and uh, Japanese tour, we're calling it a day. And we were like, what do you mean calling it a day? Well, we're going to break up the band. What? We were absolutely stunned. Sure. And of course, it... I wish that they had waited until, you know, we'd done the tours because, as you can imagine, flying to Japan and then flying to Australia knowing that this is going to be our final show... It devastated, particularly Paul Kossoff. So I know I'm uh, meandering a bit, but my point is that when we did finally break up, Paul came home. I went, you know, went over to Brazil and went world traveling. I was still only 24, you know, there's many years ahead of me. Sure. But Koss took it very, very hard and yeah. he got really strung out on quaaludes, which are like mandrax, oh, yeah. and ultimately uh, heroin. Mm. And he slipped very badly. When I got back from my travels uh, a couple of months later, it was kind of common knowledge that Koss was in really a real bad state. He missed the camaraderie of the band. He missed it terribly. Sure. And um, that's when we reformed a few months later. But that was short-lived as well. 
It was short-lived because it was an honourable reason, but it was no way to treat an addict. Right. And he should have gone into rehab, gone to meetings, got a sponsor, the whole nine yards. And Ireland Records, and I still get angry. I still feel angry about it to this day yeah. with their knowledge and their money and what was on the line. They didn't do a little bit of research mm-hmm. and figured out that this 24-year-old lad was immersed in drugs and you're going to send him home to his apartment? I know. I know. You know, it really makes my blood boil. Well, like we said so, earlier, there yeah. was no infrastructure. You know, it just no, wasn't talked about. Yeah. There was nothing to to measure it against. No. No. So it was short lived. We did another album called Free at Last, followed by a dreadful tour where Cost was really out of it. I don't know how we got through some of those shows. And then uh, yet another album, Heartbreaker. Uh, but prior to Heartbreaker, Andy Fraser recalled it quits mm. and left and went to live in LA. And so we struggled through 1973, and Koss uh, was hospitalized during that making of that album. Right. And that really was his last album with us. I always ask musicians, favorite gig, worst gig? There are many club gigs that we did. I'll tell you a quick one before we go on to Bad Company. Yeah. And this is really astonishing. We did a show in a place called Lulea up in the northern part of Sweden, mm. north of the Arctic Circle. We One of our many club gigs that we did in Europe. And we went up there, and it was so poorly attended, I think there were more people on the stage, like us, than there were out in the audience. Oh, and we, we got there, it was permanently dark, because it was in winter, mm. and we played one of the best gigs we ever played, because the four people who were in the audience became our friends, and they actually, at the end of the gig, we played so well, um, we exchanged numbers, we, uh, they wanted to take us home, there were a couple of very pretty ladies there, uh, it just became a most, one of the most beautiful gigs we ever did, and there were four people, yeah. go, go, go figure. Before we go on, I got this great little anecdote. When Free did their final show in Australia, in Sydney, we were leaving the stage. We, I mean, we were kind of burnt out because we knew this was the end, uh, although we didn't realise that we would reform a year later. But uh, to all intents and purposes, we knew that this was the end. So we were very sad traipsing off the stage at this big open air uh, Randwick Racecourse. How do I n- remember this shit? I don't remember <laughs> what I did 10 minutes ago, but I can remember the name of the, the, the place we played in is Sydney. Yeah. So we're coming off the stage and we're going back to our trailer, very despondent. And this guy yells out, Oi, Free, I love you guys. I saw you at your first gig in Chester, which is in the northwest of England. Mm. I was there when you were there with the Lexus Corner. Thank you, guys. See you next time. So here was a guy who witnessed our very first show and our very last show. And I just wow. thought it was a, a fitting wrap-up uh, of everything. And then we all went our separate ways. We're going to pick up the story next episode where Simon Kirk discusses his supergroup Bad Company. You're not going to want to miss that one. Until then, thanks for listening to the It's Only Rock and Roll Podcast.